Welcome back. In this unit, we're going to take a look at how we can improve model performance. If we can use more data, then this can obviously help us build more accurate models. However, the data must be clean and domain specific. Sometimes there won't be an option to add more data. So for example, you won't get a choice to increase the size of the training data in a data science competition. However, while working on a company project, you should ask for more data if it's available. Predictive power could be increased by adding more relevant domain-specific variables, including composite variables to capture variable interactions. A composite variable is a variable created by combining two or more individual variables into a single variable. And these are used to measure multidimensional concepts that are not easily observed. The unwanted presence of missing and outlier values in the training data often reduces the accuracy of a model or leads to a biased model with inaccurate predictions. In a multivariate model, missing values and outliers will cause the behavior and relationship with other variables to be analyzed incorrectly. So it's important to treat missing and outlier values before building a model. For missing values, in the case of continuous variables, you can impute the missing values with the mean, median, or mode. For categorical variables, you can treat missing values as a separate class. You can also build a model to predict the missing values. So for example, KNN imputation offers a great option to deal with missing values. For outlier values, you can delete the observations, perform data transformations, bin the data so that the outlier values are captured in a bin, impute the value, this is the same as for missing values, or you can treat outlier values separately. You know about data binning already. It's a data pre-processing technique that's used to reduce the effect of minor observation errors. The original data values, which fall into a given small interval, the bin, are replaced by a value representative of that interval, often the central value. And an example is to bin values for age into categories such as 20 to 39, 40 to 59, and 60 to 79. Outlier values will be assigned to the largest or smallest bin. In feature engineering, new features, the explanatory variables, are created by trying to extract more information from the existing explanatory variables. These new features may have a higher ability to explain the variance in the training data and improve model accuracy. Feature en engineering is highly influenced by business understanding. The feature engineering process can be divided into two steps. Step one is the feature transformation. So for example, data normalization is used to change the scale of a variable from its original scale to a scale between zero and one. This type of data preparation can be used to transform the scales of continuous explanatory variables. So they all have the same scale and that means a fair comparison can be made between them. For example, if we are comparing kilometers, meters, and centimeters. Some machine learning algorithms work better with normally distributed data. Therefore, we must remove skews in variables using data transformations, such as the log, the square root, or the inverse function. Secondly, is feature creation. You can create new variables, such as ratios and percentages, to enhance the prediction. A deep understanding of the business environment and knowledge of the types of features that are usually predictive will help drive the creation of these new variables.
feature selection is the process of identifying the subset of the explanatory variables that best explain the relationship of the explanatory variables with the target variable. The process has been described in a lot more detail earlier in this course. There are several different ways to accomplish, uh, accomplish this. So for example, you can use your domain knowledge, selecting the explanatory variables which may have a higher impact on the target variable based on your domain business experience. You can use visualization, using simple data visualizations to understand the relationship between variables. There are a range of statistical metrics that can be used, for example, the p-value or the variable contributions um, in the model. Principal component analysis uh, helps to represent the training data in lower dimensional spaces while still retaining the inherent relationship in the data. It's a type of dimensionality reduction technique. Remember, there are various methods to reduce the features in the training data set, such as backward and forwards feature selection, which we've already looked at. Sometimes an approach called segmented modeling can be used where classification or regression models are developed for each segment of a cluster model. Instead of trading one model, multiple models are trained. First, a cluster model is developed to create clusters of the data with common characteristics. And for example, you could use k-means here. Then separate classification or regression models are developed for each cluster. The goal is for the combined accuracy of the separate models for each cluster to be greater than the accuracy of the single overall model. Obviously, there are drawbacks, and the major drawback here is that there is a massive increase in complexity. Multiple models have to be trained. Then, when the models are scored in the model deployment phase, the cluster model needs to be run first. Then the regression or classifications uh, need to be deployed for each appropriate cluster. Therefore, there is an increase in the complexity of the model deployment process, and there is a need to maintain multiple models. This increase in complexity needs to be weighed against the possible improvement in model performance. Machine learning algorithms are driven by parameters. So for example, the number of leaves of a classification tree or the number of hidden layers in a neural network or the number of clusters in a k-means clustering. These parameters influence the um, performance and the outcome of the uh, learning process. The objective of parameter tuning is to find the optimum value for each parameter to improve the accuracy of the model. To tune these parameters, you must first have a good understanding of their meaning and their individual impact on the model. Ensemble methods were uh, we've already looked at and examined earlier in this course. They use multiple learning algorithms to obtain better predictive performance than could be obtained from any of the constituent learning algorithms. The ensemble result of the models is also more um, robust. In general, numeric target variables are averaged across multiple executions of an algorithm, whilst categorical target variables have a voting system usually run an odd number of times to avoid draws. You've seen previously that bootstrap aggregating, often abbreviated as bagging, involves having each model in the ensemble vote with equal weight. In order to promote model variance, bagging trains each model in the ensemble using a randomly drawn subset of the training set. As an example, the random forest algorithm combines random decision trees with bagging to achieve very high classification accuracy. 
Boosting involves incrementally building an ensemble by training each new model instance to emphasize the training instances that previous models incorrectly classified. In some cases, boosting has been shown to yield better accuracy than bagging, but it also tends to be much more likely to overfit the training data. Improving model accuracy is not the only goal of improving model performance. Sometimes the model might be overtrained, so the accuracy might be too high. Cross-validation is a, a popular model validation technique for assessing how the results of a model will generalize on unseen data used for model scoring. One simple method of cross-validation involves partitioning a sample of data into complementary subsets, performing the analysis on one subset called the training or estimation set, and validating the analysis on the other subset called the validation set or the testing set. This is referred to as the holdout method. One drawback is that the evaluation may depend heavily on which data point ends up in the training set and which ends up in the test set. So the evaluation may be significantly different depending on how the, this division is made. Another approach is called the K-fold cross-validation. Cross and I've shown this in the slide. This is one way to improve on the holdout sample method. The data set is divided in, into K subsets. Um, here I've named them fold one, fold two, etc. Each one's given a different fold number. And the holdout method is repeated K times. Each time one of the K subsets is used as the test set and the other K minus one subsets are put together to form a training set. Then the average error across all K trials is computed. The advantage of this method is that it matters less how the data gets divided. Every data point gets to be in a test set exactly once and gets to be in a training set K minus one times. The variance of the resulting estimate is reduced as K is increased. The disadvantage of this method is that the training algorithm has to be re, um, rerun from scratch k times, which means it takes k times as much computation to make an, an evaluation. There are also other variants that you can read about in the references. So this is a short summary of the techniques commonly used to help improve model performance. One of the most common ways to improve accuracy is to try a different algorithm. So for example, if you're using decision trees and you're not getting very good results, well, try a regression or a neural network and see if this improves the performance. So this brings me to the end of this unit. In the next unit, we're gonna take a look at the CRISP evaluation phase. So I'll see you there.